Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here and to talk to you today about a topic I think a lot of us hear about all the time, especially in healthcare. And I know South by Southwest is getting more and more into the healthcare space, wanting to talk about the issue, health technology. Uh, but I want to give you a different spin on it. You know, we often hear about the workforce crisis. What are we going to do towards the end of this decade, by 2030, when we have less healthcare workers to care for a rising demand of people as we age. And so by 2030, we're expecting that we're not going to have enough people to actually care for those that need care. And I think at places like South by Southwest, you see all this innovation. You walk down the, the exhibit hall. You hear about generative AI. You hear about all these different technologies, wearables. And you wonder, well, how does this apply to me? How are we going to figure out how all these things that you hear about at all these amazing conferences, like here, actually going to solve some of the problems that we're seeing up front. And so I'd like to spend the time I have with you today try, giving you a sense of themes, actual vignettes, products that are out there that are solving this problem, that are allowing us to actually get to a place in 2030 where we won't have a workforce crisis, where our hospitals will be protected. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes. I was asked to say that if you go to the South by Southwest app, and on this session, if you, uh, if you click on engage, thank you, uh, you can ask a question. And we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible in the back half. So you know, I know as folks are, are, are coming in, I'll, I'll continue to try to prompt that. But do please, I, I find that these sessions are, are most useful if we actually have a discussion. So I'd love to do that. So moving on back, what does the magnitude of this actually look like? How many people are we going to be short? And so what we're seeing here is it's hundreds of thousands. High-level practicing professionals, hundreds of thousands of physicians, other advanced practice professionals. We just won't have enough of them. 2030. I have a lot of colleagues in the audience here. We talk about this all the time. How are we going to square that reality? You know, you can look at various poor prognoses. But I'm not here to talk to you about the despair of the forecast that I think many of you have heard about. I'm here to talk about solutioning. This is the, I know this doesn't necessarily project well, but this is where we're at in, in red, the United States of America, right at the bottom. And what we're seeing there is that's where our life expectancy is. Here in 2024, as we're approaching 2030, where we're going to see one in four Americans represent the oldest society on record. Those Americans that are going to reach 65 are actually never, at no point in time will they have ever lived a shorter lifespan, much less health span, healthy life expectancy. We're in the bottom quartile when you think about other peer countries from an economic development standpoint in terms of healthy life expectancy. And so what have we done up to now? What have we done to square the realities that are already setting in, in our healthcare system? Not enough people to care for those that are getting older, a lower health span, a life expectancy that frankly is declining relative to other peer countries, despite us spending more per capita per individual American patient than any other country does for their patients. Well, I'll tell you how. I'm going to show you a brief clip of a video in which that demonstrates how we as a country have responded in the last four years to a crisis in a pinch. And then I'll see you on the other side. Quietly and unknown to most of the American public, the U.S. military is preparing for a new era of national security threats. This operation isn't aimed at taking the fight to the enemy. It's aimed at saving lives of the critically ill. So you have a ventilator, you have a monitor, you have an IV pump, so really a mini ICU. Exactly, exactly. Dubbed Ultimate Caduceus, the exercise simulates the rapid transport of severely injured troops from battlefields around the world to advanced care centers back in the U.S. It's a mission I've seen up close and personal as a reservist ICU physician leading a CCAT team of my own here on the West Coast. Aboard military aircraft, soldiers turned patients are transferred and stabilized in these flying ICUs, saving lives and fulfilling promises. The American people have entrusted you know, their sons and daughters uh, to defend our nation. Um, and when they become wounded, ill, or injured, uh, to be able to bring them home safely 
uh, is really the purpose. Medical readiness is just one more way that the U.S. military shows the world the physical and strategic health of its force. How does this increase the survivability of injured soldiers downrange? Oh, it's huge. It's huge because we essentially take the level of care that they can expect in a U.S. ICU. We bring that forward to the front line. With tensions rising in the Asia-Pacific theater, the war in Ukraine, and the threat of pandemic, this is a necessity, not a luxury. And so this is a C-130 bay. This is outside of Cincinnati. Uh, we were on a training mission at the time, but this was my unit outside of south of Cincinnati, right in the peak of one of the COVID waves a few years ago. And this was, this was supposed to be a training mission. What it ended up being was actually a live mission where we were caring for patients in a C-130 that were needing to be moved from places like southern Chattanooga up to places like the University of Cincinnati for advanced ECMO support. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, advanced ICU therapies to save their life. That's where we're at. There's a reason I'm showing you that. In the setting of a workforce crisis, in the setting of life expectancy declining at rates that we haven't seen, you know, we're in the bottom quartile again versus our other peer countries from an economic standpoint when it comes to caring for patients, from a healthy life expectancy standpoint. And in a crisis, what did we do? We deployed the military. I saw it up close and personal. And so it's really the question here is how will we care for more people with less people without having to deploy the military? And so that's the, that's the setup here. That's the conversation I hope we can continue for the next hour. And again, that, and that engage button for those that just came in. And then for those that are coming to the 1130 session, would love to continue this conversation. But these are the tangible ways. We talk so much about the future of healthcare. I say as a clinician, what do we mean about that? What are tangible ways by 2030 that maybe will advance the state of the art from a diagnostic standpoint? Or to help clinicians make better decisions at the point of care so that we can reach more people with less people? So this is problem statement one. I bet many of you don't actively think about this chart when you wake up in the morning. But since 1990, the University of Washington has been characterizing the burden of disease across the world. It's a fascinating study. It's the global burden of disease. Highly recommend that you look at it. Data visualizations, readily accessible. They tell an interesting story. And what's that story? Since 1990, probably dating well before this study ever actually took place, but since 1990, what have we seen? Worldwide, high blood pressure is the leading cause of death worldwide. Hasn't changed year over year, high blood pressure. We don't talk about it. In the midst of a pandemic, we talk about COVID-19, understandably. But what was happening behind the scenes, this epidemic of chronic disease? You hear about that, but you don't see this. I thought that was quite striking. And we probably all have reasons, well, gosh, why is that the case? I'd argue, and this is, the, this is part of the problem statement, we don't have great screening tools. What am I showing you? This is that cuff that I know many people don't know and uh, know, they love. They, don't, they know it, they don't love it. Cuff sizes, that blood pressure cuff, maybe you use one. Maybe it's a loved one that uses it at home. What am I showing you here? Basically, the cuff size determines the accuracy of blood pressure measurements. Many people use small and medium-sized cuffs. They tend to actually have a wide range of estimating one's blood pressure. They're often wrong. By 10 millimeters of mercury or more in the case of small and medium-sized blood, pr uh, blood pressure cuffs, which is exactly what gets sent when you buy one of these blood pressure cuffs at any type of retail environment. You have to know what blood pressure cuff to actually get for yourself. So people are either underestimating or overestimating their blood pressure at home, thinking they're getting an accurate reading. That's just a problem with the actual technology. Again, for the leading killer of humanity. We don't have a great way to screen or actually monitor for high blood pressure. So what are we doing about it? As you'll see here, so there's actually a tracker. It's a smartphone-based technology that I'm showing you here. And there's a little tracker here that's going around that oval, that circum, sort of the perimeter of the person's face. And what's happening here is the same technology 
that has been embedded in your wearable device if you're wearing one is now being leveraged contactlessly to screen for biometrics. So this is happening in places like Israel and places like Switzerland, Korea. What's happening? You can stare for 30, 30 seconds into your iPhone or into your Android and get a biometric screen in the morning. It'll tell you your blood pressure, tell you your heart rate, tell you your oxygen. It's going to give you a full readout. And I'm sure some of you are wondering, oh gosh, is this technology real? Why haven't we seen it here in the United States? Do we believe it? That's actually a shot of what's happening in the Asia Pacific. They're building this technology into refrigerators. So in the morning, you want to get your you know, half and half or whatever it is. You can get a quick scan in the morning. How are you doing? In Tel Aviv, this is a hotel room in Tel Aviv. Wake up in the morning, brush your teeth. Ask you a few questions, you stare at the mirror, you get the scan, and about 85% of the time, it's spot on, it tells you your blood pressure. This is the user experience. It's asking questions just to keep somebody engaged for about 30 seconds, because we've gotten to the point that we have to actually interact with something for 30 seconds to stay focused. But that's what's happening here. A full biometric scan contactlessly for something like blood pressure. And the technology is pretty darn good. It's called remote photoplasmography. And I'm not here to sell you on the technology. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to say that what we've long known, that pulse oximeter that measures your blood oxygen level, that's photoplasmography. I'm a pulmonologist. I use this all the time in my clinical life. That, that oxygen sensor that you might, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Now we're leveraging that same technology, shining light on somebody through one of these platforms. The head, the face, reflects it right back, whether it's to a smartphone or a smart mirror. And really, that light then gets analyzed. Machine learning is applied to actually the electromagnetic readout from somebody's face. And complexities that are far above my head ultimately result into a biometric readout. We are leveraging old technologies to innovate in a new space. What about the toilet seat? Turns out the toilet seat, if we're talking about ambient frictionless detection, diagnostics that are going to advance the state of the art, might as well start embedding diagnostics in the lived experience of one's daily life. We're all going to use a toilet. What have a bunch of cardiologists at Mass General actually figured out? Well, you can actually embed sensors into the seat, underneath the seat of a toilet, into the actual toilet seat. And so what do we have here? What have they figured out? A ballistocardiogram that actually does a 3-lead EKG. There's other sensors here that can actually detect your blood pressure in a very similar way to which remote photoplasmography is doing. And how are they leveraging this? You know, unlike RPPG, which is, I think, a few clicks away from FDA, this is actually nearing that type of regulatory approval, in part because it's a little bit more based on contact. We're a little bit more familiar with it. There's a little less error. It's about 95% sensitive. But also, what they've done here is that they're well ahead from a clinical trial standpoint. Somebody sits down for about 20 seconds Data then gets transmitted directly into the EHR. And then if somebody is, say, getting monitored for high blood pressure, heart failure, their clinician will get a ping. Hey, something's wrong with your patient. You should check in on them. They can preset filters into the EHR and, and essentially get notified if something's wrong, if their blood pressure is above 140 or 150, and then makes, make a dose change. That's exactly what's happening. We're in a world right now, whether it's a smart mirror, whether it's a smartphone app, or whether it's the heart seat, where now all of you, and maybe some of you have loved ones, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's somebody in your blast radius that you care about, will now have better diagnostics that promise an ambient, frictionless experience for you or your loved one where you can get key insights on your body 
about what's happening inside your body without even having to think about it. You know, when, when I got interested in this space, one thing I remember doing with colleagues of mine was actually doing a conjoint study of patients, doing a survey. Amongst those that were hyper, hypertensive, were already on blood pressure medications, did they like using their Omron blood pressure cuff? Not to call out that specific cuff, but that's the most common cuff. Many of them said they trusted it, they liked the device. They also said one in 10 said they re regularly used it. The other nine said they didn't like the experience. So for the leading killer of humanity, the thing that kills more people every single year than any other disease, we have a cuff-based solution that doesn't work often. And amongst those that actually have the diagnosis, 90% of people don't actually like utilizing that specific technology. That's why I'm talking to you today about what the future of affordable, accessible care looks like. Because we need better diagnostics. We need people to know as early as possible that they have a problem. And to pair that with early treatment if it's, if it's required. But again, that's why I'm also showing you this slide here. 2039 is probably going to look a lot similar to 2019 and 1990 if we do not figure out a way to take some smart risk, to start to launch and learn some of these interesting diagnostics that I think, in many cases, provide key insights for patients. Gosh, maybe, maybe I should go and get an actual formal check with my primary care doctor. If this interesting technology on my smart mirror is telling me that my, maybe something's wrong. Gosh, I didn't know that. The biggest problem, the reason why hypertension kills more people than anybody else is people present late to care. Strokes, heart attacks, you name it. This is that solution. But I'll tell you this, whenever I talk to my clinical colleagues about this, a lot of them are intrigued. But this makes a lot of people uncomfortable. There's a security and putting that cuff around somebody's arm and saying, you know what, let me put a stethoscope on the radial artery or on the brachial artery, let me listen to the pulsations, let me get a firm diagnosis. We're rooted in an habitual way to the way things have been done, especially on diagnosis. And no more has that ever been the case than in cancer. <clears throat> you know, I let off by saying I'm a lung doc. This is the utilization over time of cancer screenings in the United States since early 1990s or late 80s. And what do you see? We have pretty darn good messaging, I'd say, about breast cancer and breast cancer awareness, mammography. You should get it if you're a female and you meet certain indications as those indications continue to evolve. But I'd say we've done a generally pretty good job at building awareness. What about lung cancer? It's that bottom line, barely above zero. 5% of people in the United States of America who are eligible for a lung cancer screen, 55 to 80, some degree of smoking history, 5% of people actually get a screen. And it's not an affordability issue for many because insurance covers it. It's an awareness issue. It's a, gosh, I have to call a radiologist from my PCP to schedule it. It's difficult. It's not easy. 5%, and why, is that, why does that matter? Lung cancer is the leading risk factor, or it's the leading cause of cancer-related death in the world, including the United States. We're barely screening people, and they're dying from lung cancer at rates that we haven't seen before. Number one leading killer of cancer-related deaths in the United States. So what do we do about it? How are we going to actually solve this problem? Here I started off, again, what's the thesis for where we're at? I'd say it's, again, 2030. Not enough people to care for the demand that we're going to see. A military that got deployed in the pinch in a crisis overlapped on a chronic crisis. Now here we are, again, we're talking about a baseline crisis state, chronic disease, hypertension, lung cancer. How much can our hospitals tolerate? Really, again, it's going to be really important to think about advanced diagnostics, empowering the patient with a better sense of what's happening in their body. That's how we're going to deal with the 2030 crisis. And so what am I showing you here? These are T cells. That green amorphous thing is a T cell. Immune system, that, yep, right there, T cell. T cell green fighting a bunch of cancer cells. 
the T cell, I think some of, we've talked a little bit more about the T cell over the course of the pandemic. Critical immune system cell in our body. Also underutilized as a tool to screen for cancer. Right now, what do we tell the American public? Get your mammogram, it's gonna require a visit. Get your colonoscopy, it's gonna require a prep and a visit. It's gonna be really uncomfortable. Get your cervical cancer screen, requires a visit, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Prostate cancer screening, well gosh, should you, should you not? We don't know. There's a lot here. Lung cancer screening, 5% of the people get it who are eligible for it. We have a diagnosis problem. The screening problems, just like with hypertension, are problematic, they're difficult. There's a new way. This is real. I'm showing you stuff that's real. Just not necessarily utilized in the United States as much as maybe we, it may be in the next three to five years. I'm talking to you about real technologies, not amorphous future of healthcare stuff, generative AI. I'm gonna get to generative AI. I can't give this talk without some AI sprinkled in. But there is to say, these technologies are out there. This way of thinking is out there. Let's leverage the immune system to give us key insights about the body. The immune system, I just showed you a, graph, a visual representation of what the immune system did in a patient that had early stage one lung cancer. That's the immune system going after the earliest signs of malignancy from a lung cancer in the body, immediately. And here's the problem with something like lung cancer, in many cases ovarian cancer, breast cancer, you name it. Just like hypertension, people present to care when it's too late, when it's stage four. This might be resonant with some of you in your, in your family or your friends. People present to care when it's too late. How do we give them insights as early as possible? Let's leverage the immune system. Turns out the immune system, whether it's an infection like COVID-19, or whether it's a malignancy like lung cancer, there's a beautiful potential to it. It will recognize anything that's strange in the body and mount an immediate response. And that's what now is happening across interesting biotechnology labs, especially on the West Coast, but in parts of the country. They're saying, well, gosh, maybe I can identify the specific clone of T cells in our immune system and diagnose pancreatic cancer early. All I need is a sample of blood. Run it up against a, a colony of cells that I know detect pancreatic cancer. What about parvovirus? Multiple sclerosis, we have terrible diagnostics for, for MS. Again, you don't know you have something like MS until it's too late. That's the great power of how we're thinking about diagnosis now. Look into a mirror, let's think about how we give you key insights about your blood pressure. Because we don't want you to present with a stroke. Let's get a sample of your blood as early as possible, run it against your immune system cells, and see if something's hitting. Is your immune system doing work that you didn't know it was doing work? Maybe in some part of your body. Why is it doing that work? Well, gosh, we can map that specific colony of T cells to a fingerprint. And that fingerprint tells us, well, geez, maybe you have pancreatic cancer. We're talking, I can't tell you how many times some folks have come up to me over the last few months and asked uh, opinions on the Pranuva scan, that full body MRI the latest innovation that promises to quote unquote revolutionize how we care for individuals. And there's a lot of complexity there. Should everybody get an MRI? Does that make sense? 5,000 bucks every single year is what the prescription is to those that can afford it. No insurance company is actually paying for it to my knowledge. So $5,000 out of pocket doesn't apply to your deductible, but that's the solution. Let's just scan you every single year. It's not scalable. But maybe if we actually had a way to triage people to say, well, maybe you should get a full body MRI. Or maybe you should get a dedicated scan of your abdomen because I don't like what this T cell assay is showing me. Perhaps that's a better top of funnel to utilize a scarce resource like an MRI that costs a lot of money. But we are in a position right now where we can give people insights as early as possible as to what might be going on in their body pair that with early treatment, keep them out of the hospital, and again, date back to our thesis. How will we do more with less? 
I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. You know, we've been talking a lot about primary prevention of disease. How do I prevent you from having a stroke before it happens? How to prevent you from ha having a, a metastatic stage four cancer before it happens? That's primary prevention to a certain degree. What about secondary prevention? At home healthcare. How do we get people to stay at home? Healthy, outside the hospital. I think some, this concept of virtual care has taken off over the last especially five years. You know, I, I have uh, delighted and have a privileged role working with a great team at Amazon on what they're building. And we're part of a solution that I think has, has, has spruced up across the ecosystem. Virtual care, either synchronously through a video visit with a provider, offered at Amazon Clinic or through One Medical, parts of our care services that we provide at Amazon Health, where within just a few minutes you can get connected to a clinician. Within the comfort of your home, if you're feeling unwell, sneezing, coughing, pneumonia-like symptoms, ask a few basic questions, perhaps get a prescription if it makes sense, or maybe get escalated and get advised to go and actually see an inpatient provider if that's what needs to be done. Potentially even have your medication sent to us at Amazon Pharmacy for home delivery. Clear pricing, a checkout experience that tells you what you're gonna pay, lowest cost. Why am I showing you this? In totality, I think many of you in the room, I'm sure, have experienced or heard about virtual telemedicine offerings over the last five years especially. And so, any one of these boxes is probably not transformative in isolation. Patient-empowered care, well, got, you know, the local health system, UT, I'm sure has a very, I know has a very robust virtual telemedicine offering. But then when you pair that with perhaps an easier way for the provider to document what's going on with their patient, a streamlined history of present illness, because they're answering a few questions in a text-based format through one of our offerings, through a peer offering. When you pair that with the fact that if they want same-day delivery in a place like, say, Austin, which Amazon Pharmacy provides, they would have that option. Don't go into a retail environment that's, frankly, posing a lot of challenges. It's not easy. Maybe even promise time. I know I'm going to get that medication that day by 9 p.m. in a place like Austin or Seattle. And I know what I'm going to pay. When you think about all these innovations, going from diagnosis to treatment, that's the key piece here. Time and again, I, if there's one thing I leave you with today, is this is early insights paired with early treatment where appropriate. Whether it's hypertension, whether it's cancer, whether it's infectious disease. There are solutions that exist today, ours, others, that are allowing people to stay home, get the care they need, prevent severe advanced disease, and in, in doing so, we're protecting the hospital, allowing our inpatient providers or outpatient providers and clinics in many cases to focus on those that absolutely need to be seen in person. There's a continuous loop here. What about secondary prevention? Michael, gosh, bless him. He came here one day. Oh, he explained everything. He knew everything. All right, so we have the app installed on your phone now. It says right here, these are the things you do today. And then you scroll it up here. See, I learned that too. And then here you get, oh, your weight. Don't look at that. And this is the oximeter. This is the pulse rate and this is blood pressure. If my pulse was down, they would call me. I'll tell you, I was never alone. And of course I found out Geisinger has people too that will come to your house. I love it. I don't have to go outside the door. They call the doctors and talk to them. I could reach out to the Geisinger at home team and see if your results came back. I am 89 and I am still here to enjoy life to the fullest. Why? Because of the care and my miracle worker. She, she was talking to me in the video. I'm just I'm, I'm kidding. Um, secondary prevention. So we talked so much about primary prevention of disease. You didn't have the disease. I'm gonna give you an early insight 
as soon as possible so that we can stave off the disease from happening in the first place. Or early diagnosis of disease, better cancer diagnostics, better diagnostics for high blood pressure. We're gonna keep you out of the hospital. So to some degree, primary prevention. This is secondary prevention. You already have something, heart failure, COPD, bad diabetes, you went into the hospital, how do we keep you home once you're discharged? I can't tell you if there's one thing that's most tangible in what we're talking about today, it's this movement towards at-home hospital care, either asynchronous delivery or synchronous delivery of telemedicine services paired with at-home pharmacy, or remote care monitoring for somebody that needs remote care monitoring. Think of somebody who is a heart failure patient, needs continuous monitoring of their oxygen levels. Maybe they need dose titration of their medications like Lasix to keep their volume status at equilibration. What are we seeing, though? These are from friends of ours at Best Buy Health, who is really, really innovating in an interesting way in the at-home healthcare space. We're seeing some pretty incredible data. Look how many beds saved across four different healthcare systems based on the actual context. Baptist Health, congestive heart failure patients, 0% readmission rate after they instituted in a home health program. Virtual Health. 2,400 beds shaved. Sarah Cannon in HCA Healthcare. Patients that were on CAR-T therapy, a type of chemotherapy. 80% moved to outpatient from what is otherwise an inpatient procedure because of at-home hospital care. It's incredible. When we, again, think about how we avoid deploying the military, when we inevitably face another crisis, an acute crisis, overlapped and layered onto a chronic crisis that we know know and well, chronic disease, cancer, you name it. This is how we're going to do it. Better diagnostics, better diagnostics in the at-home environment, coupled with actual delivery of home hospital care. Home hospital, largest segment of growth, one of the largest segments of growth for health systems across the country. This is where it's going to be at. Key, key solution. to show you that, uh, that time lapse, because sometimes people think, well, gosh, this type of innovation is only in places I can afford it. This was in Rwanda. Amazing company, Zipline, doing incredible work in drone delivery of medications, something that Amazon, others are offering here in the United States. We're now seeing this paradigm replicated in places that you wouldn't think would have that type of last mile capability. But what have they figured out in a place like Rwanda, where they've been working for the last few years? Well, gosh, they can deliver 3,600, four, almost 4,000 products in the course of an eight hour shift at that, their operations facility. All of these are therapeutics, by the way. In a place that people don't think has last mile capability, 4,000 products delivered via drone, and what otherwise is viewed as a, as a health system that needs help. That's pretty incredible. Again, home hospital coupled with better diagnostics, key tools, one, two, in allowing us to deal with what we expect is gonna happen in 2030. All right, you know, as I, and again, for those that just came in, uh, for questions, love uh, in about 10 minutes transition to any questions that you may have, but if you go through the engage button on your app, uh, for any questions you may want to pose, we'd love to get there. Um, we're at the 1130 Connect offering. Clinical reasoning errors. This is the generative AI discussion I, I, I know that I'm sure you guys have already heard a lot about throughout this conference and others, especially on the healthcare side. Why are we talking about this? Especially when we're talking about the urgency of now and what's gonna happen by 2030 why does this matter? Clinical diagnostic errors. I was shocked to learn 10 to 
of delayed diagnoses or misdiagnoses were because of an upfront misdiagnosis, despite best intentions. I know all my colleagues in the clinical world have nothing but the best intention to make sure they land the right diagnosis. But the, the truth here is this, if there's gonna be a supply-demand crunch, that means less time for individual providers for their patients, especially in an inpatient setting, that means mistakes are probably gonna happen. So how do we deal with that? So that's just one of the many types of tools that I, you're going to hear about, not just from me, but maybe even from your health system, from your doc, who knows. This is what's coming online. A better WebMD, a better Google. I can ask specific questions if me as a patient want to ask them in AI-powered platforms and get specific advice that may not be actually very far off from what you're gonna hear from your provider. It's a very different world out there. But we're talking about clinical diagnostic errors, and this is where I think the potential is untapped. Super bullish here. It's from a, a company that actually a friend uh, has been leading out of Brigham and Women's Hospital out in Boston. And what are they doing? If there's ever been a WebMD 2.0, it's this and other technology like this. Pretty amazing, but imagine, here I type this in, 65-year-old patient, woman, with a history of diabetes and hyperlipidemia, presents with acute onset chest pain and sweating, was found to have some abnormalities on her EKG. So I, as say a medical student, if I were to type that in, if that was the patient I was seeing on the other side of, uh, of say the ER or the office, they came in, some type of clinical setting, Let's say I type that into Google or WebMD. Six months ago, that's what I would have had to have done. Type it into just a web browser. What would I have gotten? Probably some sort of link to a heart attack uh, website. Go read more about heart attacks. What am I getting now? I know this may not project all the way to the back, so I apologize. But what am I, what am I actually getting here is a differential diagnosis. The better the inputs into this platform, the more information I provide into this platform about what is happening with my patient that I'm seeing and evaluating, the 65-year-old woman with chest pain. If I gave them labs, if I put in other information, how long this, pa this pain has been happening for, I probably would get an even better differential diagnosis. Again, look at that. The better the input, the better the output. Specifically tailored to the patient itself. It's telling me the answer. It's replicating how a doctor thinks. What about in terms of care plan? This is a 71-year-old patient, a man here with a history of uh, shortness of breath whenever the, this person was exerting themselves, found to have swelling, found to have some abnormal heart sounds. God, what, what should I do? What should I do with this person? Let's say I'm a first-year medical student. It's giving me the answer. This might be worrisome to many of you, I understand why, that here we are now training people on machines instead of through books, making them take tests. And I get that. We're gonna have to have the human element interspersed here, provide guardrails on how we're thinking about AI especially for clinical diagnostic support. What we don't want is a bunch of people out there with minimal actual training as autonomous clinicians who don't know what to do without a machine. But I think if that risk, if that fear is overwhelming, then it's gonna stymie innovation in the first place. 
We have too many challenges ahead of us, that 2030 crisis, that I think we already felt the pangs of here in 2020 through 2023, the worst of the pandemic, that we can't afford not to take advantage of what the folks at Glass are building. That's patient-facing. That's provider-facing. It's the future. And this is really the future when it comes to provider tools. This is not, again, something that I'm just presenting to you that's out in the ether that seems intellectually interesting, so let me show it to all of you. No, this is actually being embedded in the electronic medical record. This is the view I would have as a clinician in the inpatient setting. On the right-hand bar, again, better inputs, better outputs. You're going to know what's going on with your patient because that input's already going to be in the electronic medical record. Now, if the inpatient, the person says, yeah, there's going to have to be consent. There's, of course, HIPAA is going to have to be protected across the board here. And that's what they're doing. This is all HIPAA protected, data secure. But if you're a trainee or if you're an ER doc in an overstretched community hospital, why not take the assist and augment it with human, the human touch? and have it right in the electronic record. Again, instead of having to type in what's wrong with your patient, you can press a button in the EHR within probably the next few months. This is being deployed with some health systems across the country and get a proposed differential diagnosis. Get a proposed care plan. This is the future. This is actually the current. And it's right in the EHR. All right, I'm going to close here just on the last few points. And, um, and for those that, uh, you know, w the whole expanse of what we've talked about here, um, anything is fair game. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. <clears throat> Who's going to pay for this stuff? You know, the title of this session is The Future of Affordable Accessible Care. I would argue that this, is, this and trust, which I'm going to end the talk with, are the big challenges of our time. You know, I can show you what's happening across the world with better diagnosis, earlier diagnosis of chronic disease, but someone's got to pay for it. We're seeing this play out when it comes to the weight loss drugs in the United States. I can't tell you how many people I care for or who seek advice who say, hey, doc, how do I get the RSV vaccine, which was a problem for those that remember about six months ago, you couldn't get insurance coverage, although our leading healthcare institutions were talking about it. I was talking about it. Like, absolutely go get it. Turned out they would go to a, a retail pharmacy, couldn't get it paid for. What about these weight loss drugs? We've all seen it play out, what's happening. Incredible innovation, minimal access. In many cases, the rub and the irony is that the incredible innovation is taxpayer funded. The interesting thing about the weight loss medications that we're trying to see and hope that more, more people who would actually benefit from these drugs get access to them, the seminal research on those drugs was actually done by and performed by the NIH. It was funded by the NIH, G-coupled protein receptors. We don't talk a lot about that. But the IP to allow these drugs to come to market, taxpayer funded. And so how do we make sure that innovations that are available today in other parts of the world, better diagnostics, the heart seat, the T cell serum test for cancer, early detection. By the way, not just for breast cancer or lung cancer, but for all cancers. How do we make sure that that isn't priced at a place that is incredibly unaffordable? I don't have the answers to that. I'm just teeing it up because I don't think we talk enough about it. We see the PR and we see the amazing results that are issued on the latest innovation in, in pharmaceuticals about how it's cutting heart attacks down by 50%, whatever. You can, we can fill in the blanks with the next press release. But if we don't get the access part right, that's going to be where there's a real problem. And I would urge, everything I'm talking about here today is early insights, early diagnosis. The long-term play here is it's all cost-saving for the payer, for your insurance company, for your large employer, that these upfront investments actually will save time. They're going to save time. They're going to save money. If they're going to be good for the provider from a cost-saving standpoint and from their time standpoint, it's probably going to be good for the payer. 
Let's cap it on trust. You know, I spend a lot of my, uh, my time uh, and very passionate about effective healthcare communication. What does that look like? I don't think anybody has gotten it right. I don't think there's one voice that's listened to by 100% of the United States, at least. I'm curious how others who might be joining us from, from overseas view health communication and trust their own lens and their own experience. But it's without a shadow of a doubt that we are talking about this movement, and I think it's a, it's a virtuous movement. It's a moral movement towards better access at a lower cost. I showed you Amazon Clinic, just to date back to that. The price of a visit at Amazon Clinic is often less than copay. Copay often isn't the best way. We're seeing that in terms of some of the services. I'm directly a, a part of a team that's launching, part of that broader team, that's often less than copay. We think copay is the only way. It's not necessarily the case. But why am I talking about that? We're talking about digitizing a lot of healthcare to address the access issue, maybe to even address the affordability issue. But how are we going to make sure that people trust the digitization of healthcare? If now 50% of the country is divided on whether COVID-19 was a thing, if misinformation, health information has become such a rooted problem, I do worry about creating a more faceless experience up front for many patients. Will they trust it? I've seen what we're innovating at a, at a place like, say, Amazon Pharmacy. There's clinical excellence across the board. But again, building that awareness, building that trust, it's me important. This worries me. I was going to actually show you what people's views on gun violence and reproductive health and how the majority of people across the country, this was a survey done by Kaiser, don't, are skeptical of what's the most scientifically accurate claim, whether it's gun violence, whether it's reproductive health, whether in this case, you know, we've beaten this uh, horse quite dead, whether it's COVID-19 and vaccine claims. The majority of people think something that is otherwise completely correct, at least in my opinion, is probably false or definitely false. As an example, ivermectin being an effective treatment for COVID-19. So in this environment, I tee this up, just like the payer question. I throw that to all of you for your insights. would love to hear them. But I also throw up this, or toss this idea of trust. We are digitizing healthcare for great reasons, but also in an environment where people want, many people still want and trust the person, the face that they are, that they are very familiar with, giving them medical advice. One's doctor is still, or their healthcare provider is still a very trusted person across the board. We see that time and again. We're saying, well, gosh, that can't be the only solution given what's gonna happen in 2030. We have to innovate. Well, we also have to reckon with this. We're digitizing access right around the time many people, most people think ivermectin is an effective treatment for COVID-19. One solution. I'll leave you at, at least one solution, is I think we have to do a better job up front when we face inevitably the next respiratory pandemic. I'd say the, the one biological threat that is now being prioritized above all else by our government. Short of nuclear war with, an, with, with a state actor, biological threats, the next respiratory pandemic is something that we're preparing for appropriately. Constant spillover events are happening across the world. We, this is a threat that we know is clear and present. But this is how we communicated to the American public, at least, about COVID vaccines. In the social space, in the digital space, on air, we talked about Johnson & Johnson and variety of, well, 58% for this variant, 72% for this variant. Nobody understood, I mean, I barely understood this. I'm sure many of you probably struggle to piece together the latest he uh, news headline. And I'll close by saying, I think we, we need a better, better strategy to engage in the social space. I posted this very active, at least on, on, on the X platform, especially at the peak of the pandemic, a picture of lungs with COVID and without COVID, and compared it to the engagement that we saw with a leading article on COVID-19 published in the New England Journal of Medicine at the time. And again, I'm not saying that X in any way should replace the New England Journal of Medicine. That would be a bad day for our country, for the world. But what am I saying about engagement? Where do people get 
their health information. They get it through a social media tweet as, ex as one example, that gives them clear communication on what they should do, which is in this case, get the vaccine, because it, provide, it stops the right-sided lungs from ever occurring in your body. You'll stay healthy with those left-sided lungs. Basic information, a strategy for the modern age on how to communicate. That I think many of you will probably say, well, gosh, of course, we've seen how this all plays out. Obvious, sure. But are we there yet? Do we have these mechanisms in place? Do we feel comfortable utilizing the best tactics in public health messaging, which are often visual forms of media? The best way that, to actually tackle the smoking epidemic throughout the 1980s and 2000s was incredibly disturbing images on a smoking carton. That has actually been tried and true as the most effective tactic to reduce people and get them to quit smoking, to reduce smoking and get, get them to quit smoking. Not, God, well, gosh, you know, lung cancer is going to set in, these stats, this table for smoking. No, it's something incredibly disturbing with a simple message. So it's all to say, we got a lot of work to do by 2030, but everything that I've shown you guys today is real. It's not, it's not amorphous, it's not sort of preclinical pre stage one, it's all real. We can do better diagnostics for high blood pressure, we need to. Otherwise, 2019 is going to look a lot, or 2039 is going to look like a lot like 2019. We're not going to change anything about the burden of disease, unless we start to think outside the box on how we diagnose people, give them early insights as to what's going wrong with their body. A better way to cancer screen. I think in 20 years, we're going to look at how we screen for cancer and say, gosh, we made people go in and do four laborious tests based on their health, their health and their, you know, their indications many day preps in some cases for one disease when there's hundreds of cancers? What about one blood test to detect them all? What about at-home healthcare for more people to keep them out of the hospital? Primary prevention, better secondary prevention, protect the hospital. But again, we can't lose sight of who's gonna pay for it and building trust. And so with that, I know we have a few minutes left. I think I went into some of the Q&A time, but if there are any questions, again, engage button on the app. Would love to hear your thoughts. Um, ooh, I'm seeing a lot come in. Uh, so I'm gonna, I, I'm managing the direct Q&A, but we can have conversation after, we're, uh, after the session or at the 11.30 talk. Um, so uh, one question was, how can products better leverage technology to make the health data digestible for patients? That's such a great question. You know, I think, uh, to, the, uh, to the person that asked the question, there are, there's an abundance of wearables out there that is providing a 24-7, 365 pulse on a patient. And yet, very few people are actually going into the app for, say, the Apple Watch and, and, and looking at the readout every single day of their heart rate variability, something that's cr incredibly important when you're thinking about your underlying cardiovascular health. There's a lot that we can glean from something like heart rate variability that I think probably 99.9% .9 of the American population probably has, to, has no understanding of what that actually exists, or what that metric actually means, much less how to find it in their phone. And so I think a lot of the answer to that question is we gotta better educate people on how to use the wearables that they've already invested in. Or for example, a lot of Medicare Advantage plans are investing in wearable devices for their high-risk patients to enable better at-home healthcare. But what are people paying attention to? Their step count, nothing wrong with that. But behind the step count is about 25 other metrics that are constantly being digested in an app-based format for that specific wearable device that I would say largely goes on a, uh, completely ignored. So the, the spirit of the question is so important because I think there's, there's such underutilization of all the information that somebody is accruing on their body every single day. And so we have to really proactively, and this is the problem, this, is, this comes down to regulation. A lot of these feature sets from a lot of these wearable devices are not regulated. As a result, there's not a lot of proactive communication from providers to patients on, well, gosh, this is how you should use a wearable device. This is how you should stay healthy and well. This is what heart rate variability means. So I think part of the problem is a chicken or an egg. One is regulation. And if we had proper regulation and oversight, it would provide an incentive for providers, and ultimately for patients, to better understand all the data that's accruing on their body. 
That's a great question. At home, at home care is a miracle. It also adds incredible stress to the caregivers, parents, spouse, even children. What are we doing to support caregiver stress? Gosh, I mainly uh, articulate the question because I don't, of course, I'm part of, I'm part of an audience here that broadly that thinks that that question has gone completely unanswered. We don't have enough social support for caregivers that are actually enabling at-home healthcare. We don't have financial support for them. In many cases, they're not actually getting paid for the work they do providing care for a loved one or a family member. These are public policy discussions. I would say they're, nece they're not necessarily the purview of a healthcare policy debate. These are, these are debates on who should and should not be considered a worker and classified as doing legitimate at-home work for somebody who would otherwise receive hospital-based care. It's a critical, critical question about equity, about making sure that we're doing the right thing for patients and ultimately for the people that are providing their care. But I would broaden that out in my opinion. But again, I think that's an area of debate. That this is a this is a public policy consideration. This is a public policy question, but an important one. <clears throat> What's the role of universal health care in the pursuit for equity, value, and why don't we talk enough, talk enough about it? You guys are you guys are really answering asking me easy questions. Um, I would say, <clears throat> listen, I, we're talking about affordable, accessible health for a reason. I ended one of the, the, the key facets here was who's going to pay for all this innovation. Because it angers me as much as I'm sure it angers many of you actually caring for patients at the bedside that here we hear about all these amazing things, endless miracles by press release, and yet who is benefiting from it? How are we supposed to talk about these things? And so do I think universal health coverage is going to be the balm and is going to broadly start to cover the next greatest, latest innovation? No, there's too, many, there's too many barriers to that. There's too many controls on the economic side where the next greatest innovation, assuredly there's gonna be many down the, down the road, I've already highlighted a few, that are, have penetrated other parts of the world, but not necessarily the United States. There's gonna be a cost benefit here. If we're talking about universal health coverage, I worry that some of these innovations will be even more constrained than they already are. But again, this is something that if something, I firmly believe if we have taxpayer funding driving the IP on something so transformative like a GLP, we can't then launch it and talk about it all the time and not expect there to be also overarching regulatory considerations on who should have access. If we are all paying for that innovation, one would expect the American patient should have durable access. And I think we're going to get there. I do think we're going to get there. There's going to be a relief. But the UHC question, you know, I, I, again, whomever asked that would love for you to come to the 1130 feature uh, Speaker Connect. Uh, <clears throat> I know I have two minutes. Do you believe in 2024 that there is still a need for VA hospitals? Why shouldn't our veterans have access to hospitals that we have? Well, they do. The, Veterans have broad access and can use TRICARE anywhere. The benefit with TRICARE is, and, and the whole idea of TRICARE, which is their insurance, is that they would get ready access completely free of charge, no co-pays through a VA system. And I'm sure the pr person who asked the question probably is highlighting what is clear and present to all of us who have some direct connection to the military, indirect or, in, uh, or direct, which is, well, gosh, that system isn't working all that great in the first place. And yes, the answer to your question is they should have durable access with the same financial incentives and the same financial relief if the local VA health system cannot meet their needs. And that's what's happening more and more, but again, it's, it's still unfortunately a ramp. Mental health needs of our society are reaching, and I think this is, this is, I'll cap it here. Mental health needs of our society are reaching critical levels. How do we address the need for emotional balance and well-being at scale? I'd like to think that part of the whole process of focusing on early prevention or early insights, early prevention means less disability, physical disability, and more time to stay healthy and to focus less on life expectancy and more on health span. I think we focus so much on how long we're gonna live and less on health span. How well are we gonna live? We have to switch how our health system delivers care. Early insights, 
early treatment focusing on health span. So indirectly, I do think that we're going to be actually addressing the issues when it comes to mental health and that epidemic by investing in some of these technologies, again, that are already present in many parts of the world. But with that, I'm going to close, let you guys get to your 11 o'clock. Thank you so much for just being here and for your attention and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.